All right, so we continue our conversation here and um, pre-analytical errors. And we're gonna look at some of the problems that we're gonna encounter with the actual sites that we're gonna be selecting. I know it's very easy sometimes to go for the first vein that you see, but you have to consider other things that may affect your results. So some of the problems that you might see are burns. Obviously when somebody has a burn, yeah, it's pretty common sense that you're not gonna be puncturing around there, but not only directly on the burn, but because when somebody suffers a burn in any part of their body, uh, especially their arms, they're going to be experiencing increased amount of circulation to the area. As the body tries to repair itself, there's gonna be increased blood flow, increased fluids. So when you're going to collect from this area, you may have a, what we call a hemo diluted specimen because of the amount of increased blood flow. So consider that before you puncture an arm with that, even if it's distally or um, centrally towards the body, uh, you have to consider those uh, factors, okay? Veins that are difficult to palpate are, you know, when there is swelling, obviously it's gonna be a lot more difficult. <clears throat> Areas where you may have uh, impaired circulation, there's no blood flow, it's gonna be very difficult for you to obtain a specimen from, from that site. If there's a new burn, obviously you have um, pain uh, because of the swelling. Now, a person that has tattoos, Someone that uh, just had a, a fresh tattoo, maybe within the last 24 hours, uh, even if they do let you puncture around that site, which they probably won't because they just had a brand new tattoo, you will have problems because they may be at higher risk for infection, okay? So it'd be very uh, risky to collect it from there. So avoid those areas if it's a freshly new tattoo. Now, even if it's an old tattoo, when someone, uh, has an old tattoo and you puncture the area. And uh, if that person happens to have some kind of bleeding uh, under the skin, it's gonna be difficult to visualize it because they almost look like a bruise. A bruise almost looks like a tattoo. So it may be difficult to, uh, to catch it right away and may evolve into a hematoma, which is one of the H words, which is a really a, a large amount of blood collection under the skin, which results in, in pain and may even result in uh, obstruction or uh, affecting the nerves of that specific arm. So if you have no choice but to draw in an area with a, a tattoo, try to insert the needle in a spot that does not contain any dye or very light dye so that you can uh, obviously be able to detect any problems. Now, other problem areas you may encounter are damaged veins. Damaged veins are those veins that are sclerosed or hardened. How do those feel? When you palpate a vein, remember we're looking for a bouncy sensation. We wanna make sure that that vein is nice and bouncy and that it's filled with fluid or blood. We don't wanna uh, try to collect a specimen from a vein that is hard. So don't get confused. Always look for that bouncy uh, sensation when you're palpating for the, for the veins, right, in, in patients. Sometimes those sclerose veins look very tempting. They're right there, they're sticking out, but uh, they may be clotted or thrombosed, okay, which is also not a good thing. You will not be able to get any uh, blood specimens from there. And obviously, they'll be difficult to puncture. So avoid those areas, those veins that are sclerosed or thrombosed, either they're hard or they're very clotted, okay? Use another side if possible or draw away from it distally, okay, so that you don't get any, um, any uh, abnormal results from there. Other problem sites that you might encounter are edema. Edema is swelling caused by abnormal accumulation of fluids in the tissue. So results uh, with fluid such as IVs, because sometimes the IVs that are in the patient's arms uh, will infiltrate or meaning the liquid will start leaking into the skin. So what you're gonna see is a lot of swelling. You don't wanna collect a specimen from the area. Okay, this will result in erroneous results and it contaminates your blood specimen with all this extra fluid, okay? Besides, when there is swelling, as I just said, veins are gonna be much harder to locate and the tissue is very fragile. It might, you cause more complications such as a hematoma. So usually phlebotomists in their early morning rounds uh, in the hospitals or in, in nursing homes when they often go very early in the morning, and the first ones to notice any edema or infiltrated IVs. If this is the case, you need to report it right away. And again, avoid any uh, arms or collection of uh, specimens from these areas that are infiltrated with IV fluids. Now, a serious complication that can also occur is a hematoma. 
A hematoma, as I said earlier, is a swelling or a mass of blood collected under the skin. Sometimes it, it, it trickles down very slowly and it develops over a few days. But this may often occur with two people that are taking anticoagulant medications. If blood takes too long to form a clot, uh, when you release, discharge that patient from your, from your site or your office or wherever you're at, and um, you do not uh, apply enough pressure right for a while, they're going to be oozing blood. But sometimes it doesn't just ooze out, it oozes inside the arm when you cannot see. So if patient is taking anticoagulant medications, I always encourage you to uh, maintain pressure for at least three to five minutes, even if they're not bleeding. Uh, apply a, a small pressure dressing so that pressure can be applied to the area and minimize the amount of bleeding that's going to be inside the arm. If you don't, then you might have a large hematoma and a big problem uh, ahead of you. Okay, so make sure that you apply prolonged uh, pressure. Again, if there is a hematoma already, right, how can you tell there's hematoma? Well, hematomas are very painful. When you try to palpate around and it's kind of bluish around there, avoid that area. Please avoid it because you may make it worse. Or if you do con um, collect a specimen from a hematoma area, you're, it's going to be contaminated with other uh, tissue body, uh, body fluids that are there already. So please avoid those areas. Uh, as much as possible. Hematomas uh, resulting from venipuncture, sometimes even they're very small, okay, or they could be very large. So please make sure you make any uh, documentation, any incident reports, uh, if you notice the, um, the hematomas right away. Okay, they may develop very quickly or they may develop very, very slowly especially if you accidentally puncture an artery. Remember arteries pulsate, so when you collect your specimens, you're gonna see blood squirting into your tube or they may fill very quickly, whereas veins usually they'll fill very, a little bit slower, all right? So make sure that you apply enough pressure on those and make any documentation, now, not on the patient's record, but in a separate incident report. Problem sites and mastectomies. Uh, females that have had a mastectomy in the past can actually have a serious problem because when you apply a, a tourniquet to an arm, you say the, the female had a mastectomy, uh, removal of the tissue, right? Of the tissue, the breast tissue. Uh, when you apply that tourniquet, what you're actually doing is uh, applying pressure here, right? Limiting circulation and it backs up down back to this side of the body. So you're gonna cause increased swelling, which swelling causes pain. And in the end result, you may cause lymph flow to be obstructed, right? And the lymph nodes that are in this area of the arm, okay? It causes swelling, which may cause infection. And of course, that is a complication or a problem, right? So please make sure that uh, you are aware the patient has not had any type of uh, uh, mastectomies in the past. Uh, by applying the, the tourniquet in this affected site can also change your blood composition. And as a result, you will have uh, in, uh, in correct results or inaccurate results. Now, obesity can also be a problem uh, when you're going to be collecting a specimen because veins may be a little bit deeper and hard to find, as you may experience when you're trying to palpate a vein. They're not visible. You really have to trust and gain experience and trust your palpation technique. Uh, it's not easy, but it does take a while to gain this, uh, this confidence in yourself. Uh, you may use a longer tourniquet uh, if, um, if you don't have the, you know, the regular ones are too short. You, know, you can barely make a, a knot or if they're uh, rolling into itself and you know it's turning into a rope and you're cutting off circulation, uh, you're gonna leave a, a bad mark. So be careful with that. Try, you can also try using a blood, uh, blood pressure cuff, which you can inflate up to 40 millimeters of mercury if necessary. Uh, try the median cubital or cephalic veins uh, if um, you're unable to pop, uh, see any veins or palpating the veins. Remember that median cubitals are the ones that are right in the middle of the antecubital area and your cephalic is the one on the outside of the arm and goes to your head. Always avoid your basilic vein. Only nurses um, can collect specimens from vascular devices. So we're moving on to other vascular devices that you might encounter in uh, the intensive care units. You're going to see a lot of arterial lines uh, that are placed on patients. And these are placed on there because they need to be monitored. Uh, they need to closely monitor the arterial blood pressures. So they have these lines that are connected to an artery, which is usually the, the radial artery or the ulnar artery. And 
specimens can be collected from there. However, they have to be collected by a nurse, has to be by a licensed professional. So when you do get these specimens, you are also gonna have to make sure that you document that the specimen is a arterial specimen and not a venous. So therefore we can use the ranges for arterial blood, not venous blood. Very, very important to remember that, okay? Our arterial lines provide accurate and continuous measurement of blood pressure. Again, this is for more the medical management. Uh, your job is to make sure that you give the nurses the right tubes in the right order of draw. Use a discard. Remember, if you're going to collect specimens from an, any kind of line, you, may, you will have to use a, a discard tube before you collect your other tubes, right? Only nurses and other specially trained personnel are allowed to draw blood from specimens such as vascular access devices, arterial lines, uh, pick lines, central lines, and so on. The phlebotomists typically assist uh, by supplying the appropriate tubes, and if syringe is used, transfer the blood to the tubes using a safety syringe transfer device, which uh, we've done in the past. No tourniquet is necessary because the blood will automatically be used to draw. Usually, they use a syringe to pull the blood out from the arterial lines. Now, there are some patients that are on hemodialysis. They have a, a shunt or a fistula on uh, usually the left arm, but they can also be found on the right. Uh, they're located usually in the anticubital area, sometimes in the distal part of the arm, and sometimes even in the upper part of the arm. So you have to be careful by simply asking the patients if they are on dialysis, if they have any uh, surgical procedures on either side, may um, answer all your questions. So these shunts are permanent, okay? But many times they stop working for whatever reason, they get clotted or they just don't function correctly anymore. Many times they are left in place. It's better to just leave them in place. So if the device, the shunt or fistula is not being used, then you are, um, okay, it, it is acceptable to collect blood from that arm, but not from the shunt itself, but from another part of the arm, okay? Uh, these, uh, these devices are placed in surgically uh, and it's fusing of an artery in a vein. Okay, so you have two types of blood flowing through those shunts. But again, you're going to be collecting blood from probably the hand or somewhere on the arm away from the, from the shunt itself. These, again, are mainly done uh, for treatment for hemodialysis, right? And as I mentioned, they're located in the back part of the arm, usually in the anticubital area. You can uh, quickly spot them when you see like a bulging, like a bulge in the area. Of, uh, it looks bulky. If you lightly palpate, if you put your hand over it, you're gonna feel like a little purring cat, right? When you when you feel cat purr, you can hear like like a very fine vibration. That's what they feel like, okay? And when we use a stethoscope, we put it on here and we put the diaphragm on the on the fistula. You can actually hear the the brewy. We call it the it's a whooshing sound where the blood the arterial blood is being pushed through the fistula. You can actually hear it with your stethoscope. But that is for, for nurses to to do. There are other vascular devices that yeah you will come across. These are called um, portacasts. Portacasts. These small devices are surgically implanted by a uh, physician, obviously, uh, usually on the left upper chest, but you can also find them on the right upper chest. These are usually connected to an artery or a vein. Okay. These portacasts are used for long-term treatment, uh, usually of uh, chemotherapy. Instead of the patient having a risk of getting um, an infiltration with chemotherapy, which may damage the arm, they place these little, very small devices. So you only see a very um, small circle about the size of a quarter. Now these devices are accessed or we access them uh, using a Huber needle. It's a 90 degree needle that is inserted into the catheter. And then we connect a uh, small tubing connection that we can uh, infuse medications, we, but we can also collect blood samples. So if a patient has a vascular device that is accessed, meaning there is a, a tube coming out and the nurse is there, you can ask the nurses to collect the specimen from there. Again, you will need to make sure that you collect a discard tube, all right? And then hand the tubes, assist the nurse by giving them the tubes in the correct order of draw. So you discard your, uh, your red tube or your syringe, whatever device you're gonna be using to collect your specimen. Uh, but again, remember, only a nurse can, can collect the sample. You, know, you as a phlebotomist are not allowed to collect directly from, from a portacast or other vascular devices. If uh, any infection comes up or anything, complications happen, you're not at liable. You're not liable or responsible for that. Uh, this is a convenience for the patient because you don't have to uh, stick them. However, if the patient has a portacast but it is not accessed, then you will have to perform a venipuncture. 
patients sometimes will tell you that they have the device and they want you to collect it from there, but you um, be politely have to explain to them that you're not allowed to collect it from there unless the device is accessed and it has to be by a nurse, all right? So remember that. Vascular devices such as IVs where people get, um, you know, hydration therapy, antibiotics and so on uh, are usually managed by the nurses. It is not recommended that you, um, that you collect specimens from here, okay? Now, when we put an IV on a patient, usually a very small plastic catheter stays inside. We use a needle to, to uh, pierce the skin, to uh, pretty much open the way for the catheter, okay? We leave that little plastic inside and we withdraw the needle and then we tape it down. So once the catheter is in the vein, we use it again to administer uh, the IV fluids or medications. It provides access for administering um, or even drying blood. However, it's not recommended that uh, you collect blood from here because many times these catheters are very, very thin and they may get uh, occluded with blood. So uh, to play it safe, we usually do not allow um, collection of blood from these samples because, because of the complications uh, and they have to be flushed and of course has to be collected from a nurse. Many times you will not have time to wait for a nurse to come in and, and do uh, draw the specimen for you. So you might as well collect. Um, you always wanna collect um, centrally to the, to the patient. For example, the, if the patient has a IV here on the wrist area, you have to collect above the site. Okay, if it's on the hand, above the site. All right, remember, never collect away from it because whatever antibiotics or uh, IV fluids that they're receiving will affect your blood sample. Okay, so remember that uh, even if you collect a specimen from an arm that has an IV and they're receiving fluids, obviously that IV fluid has to stop for at least a minute, okay? When you collect your sample, you need to make a note of it. You know, blood sample collected from arm patient receiving, you know, such and such IV fluids. So that way the, the technologist that is going to process the specimen knows that if there is a high sodium level, high potassium level, it may be because of the collection of the, uh, uh, the collection site where you collect your specimen from. So just kind of remember that. And uh, if you could if you possibly avoid collecting samples from an arm that has an IV, an IV therapy, uh, it's a higher risk and more likely to yield an incorrect result, right? So when you do uh, notice an IV site, an IV line inserted into a vein, again, avoid collecting blood from that site, uh, blood may be contaminated. So move on to another site if possible. Previously, uh, active IV sites, avoid collecting uh, sites where they had it before within the last 24, 48 hours, because if the IV was infiltrated, that means that there's still fluid around. Remember, we just talked about edema. If there, you see a, a arm looks kind of swollen or big, you compare it to the other arm. If one is bigger than the other one, that, that's probably what happened. The IV infiltrated and there's a lot of still a lot of fluid in there. So you don't want to collect it from there because it will contaminate your specimen. Central vascular access devices or indwelling lines, we call them uh, uh, PIC lines or peripherally inserted central catheters or central venous catheters, usually here, okay? And PIC lines are usually out here. They start in the antecubital or somewhere in here. They're uh, inserted using a, a small uh, ultrasound machine and uh, by trained uh, professionals. And they're used mainly for long-term, long-term IV therapy, long-term antibiotic therapy, and so on. So we, uh, we have to allow the nurses to uh, collect specimens for you from these sites. Do not do that. Uh, it's very easy, but um, again, it's not in your scope of practice. So you make sure that you don't collect specimens from there. Uh, you have your central venous catheters. Uh, they're inserted into large veins, so usually the subclavian veins, which just lies up here, okay? It goes into the vena cava and then into the heart. Uh, you have your small ports that I talked about, your, um, your porticast. You have your pick lines that are usually over here. Again, it is not within your scope to collect specimens from here. Uh, now we're gonna discuss uh, another topic. This is called, we're gonna talk about patient complications. Patient complications and conditions. Now we'll be discussing patient complication and conditions because this is a very important aspect of uh, your work, okay? This is part of your uh, the steps in the venipuncture procedure that you, we've been talking about and practicing already. So 
you have to make sure that you always ask for allergies. Again, this is a safety measure. You do not want to expose the patient to products uh, such as latex or iodine, which the patient may have allergies to. So again, make sure that you ask about allergies. Uh, allergies to tape, some people are very sensitive to, to plastic tape. So you might have to use the paper tape, which is called hypoallergenic tape. Um, always place your gauze over the site. Have patient remove it usually at least 15 minutes. Remember to instruct the patients to not lift anything heavy or bend their arm. Do apply pressure to the site for at least five minutes and, uh, and leave the bandage on there afterwards. Allergies to antiseptics. Antiseptics are made of usually alcohol. So if a person has an allergy to alcohol, please make sure that you, um, that you are aware of that. Latex, of course. Look for any signs indicating latex allergy if um, the patient's arm turns red immediately. Uh, it's very important that you uh, report that, make an incident report. Uh, look for any signs uh, in the patient's room or the door that tells you about any specific type of allergies or restrictions, such as no blood pressure to the left arm, no needle sticks to the left arm, and so on. To make sure they always use non-latex material and always ask, uh, because some gloves uh, are made of latex, tourniquets, and other bandages. So it's very important that you ask about latex allergies. Patients with known allergies often wear special armbands. So also pay attention to any kind of armband that they might have next to their hospital ID band. It will give you any um, pointers about their allergies. Excessive bleeding could be a complication that happens usually because the patient is taking anticoagulants or aspirins, which is very common. And they usually tend to bleed a little bit longer than most people. So in this case, you will maintain pressure until the bleeding stops. Remember not to apply the bandage and the tape and forget about the patient. Once you instruct the patient to apply pressure to the puncture site after you remove the needle, you have to go back. You have to go back and check the bleeding before you actually tape it down. If bleeding continues more than five minutes, notify the appropriate personnel, usually the nurse or your supervisor, uh, so that they are aware that if any um, complications occur that you did make the right communication. Never apply a pressure bandage uh, instead of maintaining pressure until the bleeding has stopped, okay? Do not miss any, and out, do not dismiss any outpatients or leave an inpatient until bleeding has stopped or the appropriate personnel have taken charge. For example, if you're in a hospital and the patient won't stop bleeding, uh, please notify the nurses so they can take control of that and you can move on to your next patient. If it's in an outpatient setting, however, you have to uh, stay there until the uh, bleeding stops Okay, you bandage the area, but I would also notify the physician so they're aware of the possible complications. Another possible complication that may occur during the procedure is fainting. Now, fainting doesn't occur often, but it can occur. So you always wanna make sure that you ask a patient. Usually I, I tell you to ask about uh, history of um, fainting or history of fear of blood, fear of needles that may cause them to faint. Okay, fainting is a loss of consciousness. And usually their posture uh, changes, sometimes their blood drops, okay? So fainting is usually caused by insufficient blood flow to the brain, and that's the only reason, that's the only thing that happens. Patients with a history of fainting are better secured in a lying position, okay, or in a reclining chair. You wanna anticipate any possible complications, and you can do this by um, taking the necessary precautions, such as lying them down or using a recliner. Uh, in the chairs that do not recline, you might want to lean them forward as long as they have the uh, the resting um, front of it, okay, where they're not going to fall forward. Okay, this brings their head closer to the chest and allows them to breathe a little bit easier and recover faster. If possible, elevate the extremities to increase circulation back to the brain. Another complication that can occur is nausea and vomiting. It doesn't happen too often, but you have to be prepared for it. If a patient does uh, verbalize or tells you that they're feeling a little bit queasy, like they feel like uh, nauseated, right away you should discontinue the blood draw until it goes away. Give the patient right away a waste basket, a, a, a plastic bag or something where they can vomit in case they do uh, continue with the uh, with nausea and end up uh, vomiting, okay? Meanwhile, you can apply a cold or uh, a damp washcloth through the forehead because they may start uh, sweating as a reaction of the nausea. And you want to, it does kind of help to make them feel a little bit better. So again, be prepared for somebody may, that might have nausea and vomiting. If the patient's nausea uh, or vomits uh, and refuses to 
you know, does not want to continue with the procedure, obviously you have to inform the, um, the appropriate uh, personnel, especially the physician who might be awaiting the results of the specimen. They might ask you to reschedule or have them wait a little bit longer and maybe try once again if the patient agrees to it. Now pain is something that will be experienced during the venipuncture procedure and uh, we expect minimal pain and we try to keep it to a minimal. But do warn the patients, tell them before the needle insertion that they're gonna feel some pain but you're gonna keep it to a minimal. Do never, never tell them that it's not gonna hurt because it does hurt and um, they may be mad at you or they might react, overreact when you insert the needle into the, into the skin. So avoid excessive deep blind or lateral direction of the needle. Some people call it fishing. When you go into the vein and you are right next to it and you try to redirect and go lateral side to side and back and then to the other side and you're just kind of probing it around and all you're doing is looking for trouble. All right, you might uh, be close to a, to a tendon, to a nerve and you might cause excessive damage. Uh, and here's where the liability increases the risk. Okay, so make sure that you don't do any excessive uh, or deep blind or lateral redirection of the needles. It can cause severe problems. If a person complains of extreme pain or numbness to the, to the, to the area, maybe I feel like an electric shock running down their hand, you might have poked a nerve, okay? Remove the needle immediately, apply ice, and of course, document the incident because it may come back in a couple of months, you may be uh, served with a lawsuit because of possible damages to the hand or injury. So again, blind uh, uh, probing around is not recommended at all, all right? Something else that you might encounter, and it's kind of rare, is a petechiae or petechiae, however you like to pronounce it. These are very tiny, non-raised red spots. It almost looks like an allergy reaction, but it's not. These are actually uh, capillary beds, okay, that sometimes they, they bleed, okay, they, the little spots, okay, they appear in an arm when the tourniquet is applied. So if you put on the, the tourniquet on there and you see little pinpoint dots all over the place, these are called petechiae, okay? And it's not. It's nothing that you cost, it's just that the person's um, capillaries are very weak and they start to form these uh, little dots. Another uh, possible complication that you might encounter during your venipuncture procedure is seizures or convulsions, all right? Uh, usually when you ask, uh, when you're going to um, uh, perform a procedure in a patient and you're talking to them, they might tell you that they have experience or, or they have a, a condition with seizures, right, or convulsions. Now, uh, in this case, you're gonna have to be prepared for it. As you know, seizures are uncontrollable electrical activity in the brain. So what happens, the person lose consciousness, okay? They may not respond or react to your voice commands. Um, they don't last very long. They usually last less than 30 seconds or a minute. However, if somebody does start seizing, okay, they're not fainting when people pass out, usually they see black and then they, they collapse sideways forward or whatever. Uh, a seizure, usually their, always, their eyes may roll back, okay? And they will, not, uh, they will not respond to verbal commands. So discontinue the draw, the procedure right away. Hold pressure over the site without restricting their movement. Remember, sometimes if the patient has convulsions, they may be moving their arms uh, back and forth and they may injure themselves. So uh, if they do tell you they have history of seizures, they're best uh, served in a bed or in, in, at home, it would be in their couch or a reclining chair, but you have to make sure that their arms do not get stuck anywhere uh, with, within the chair, right? Anything that restricts movement of their limbs while they're having a seizure can actually cause injury, All right? So do not hold pressure over or do not restrict the patient's movement. Allow them to have the seizure. Do not put anything in the patient's mouth. Never insert anything in their mouth. They're not going to choke with their tongue. They're not going to aspirate, okay? Protect patient from self-injury. Sometimes the head may be moving, they may be um, convulsing in the head. You, you can try and protect the head as much as you can by applying a piece of cloth, a pillow or something there. Again, this is before you actually start the, the procedure, okay? Sometimes the, the stress of having a procedure done may, uh, may cause a, the onset of a seizure or convulsion. So just be careful and be prepared for it, okay? Notify first aid personnel. There's nothing you can do to stop a seizure, but there's a whole lot that we can do to prevent injury from a seizure, all right? So it's important that you know how to handle uh, patients before they have a seizure. There are some procedure errors or risks um, that 
we can cause, okay, inadvertently, obviously we don't do things uh, on purpose, but a hematoma formation. We talked earlier about hematoma formation. A hematoma is a, a collection of blood under the skin that becomes very, very uh, sometimes hard and it starts to create pressure, okay? If you see blood spilling around underneath the skin, like a, a lot of bruising uh, starts to, to, to go around the puncture site, stop the procedure immediately and apply pressure for at least at least two minutes, okay? Because when you insert the, the needle into the vein and you go right through the vein all the way across, you made another hole on the bottom. So when you pull the needle back and you get, you start to see blood come into your tube, right? And you're collecting your tube, the blood, the hole that you made on the bottom of the vein on the other side is still leaking. So what happens sometimes they'll leak very, very quickly, especially for patients that are taking anticoagulants. They're gonna start bleeding and they're gonna have a big, big uh, hematoma or it looks like a big bruise. But I want you to know the difference. Bruising is just discoloration or bluish discoloration. Hematoma is actually blood pulled under the skin, which will cause pressure and pain, and even dirt, uh, nerve damage uh, in some cases. So apply pressure for at least two minutes, offer cold compresses or ice packs to reduce circulation to the area to minimize the bleeding, okay? Again, this is considered a serious complication that may require even surgical intervention if it gets that bad. If there's a lot of blood pulled under and it's causing pressure and pain, uh, they, uh, a doctor may have to go in there surgically and remove some of that excess, uh, you know, that coagulated blood to remove the pressure and the pain. But again, this is a serious complication, so be very careful with it. Another complication that occurs, and it's not uh, intentional, obviously, is called iatrogenic anemia. You have to make sure that you know what iatrogenic anemia is. Anemia, obviously, is a low red blood cell count. Iatrogenic is self-induced or caused by healthcare personnel. When somebody uh, develops iatrogenic anemia, it's usually caused by healthcare providers, okay? It's brought on by the blood loss from too many blood draws, too many blood draws. A lot of patients go to the a doctor and then that doctor sends to another doctor and they get blood uh, samples every doctor they go. By the time you know it, this patient is looking pretty pale. Why? Because of the amount of blood draws that have been uh, collected from one doctor and another doctor, all right? So you cannot exceed more than 10% of the blood volume at any point, never more than 10%. If you have five liters of blood, okay, in your body, we cannot collect more than 500 mLs because it might actually cause serious reaction, uh, shortness of breath and uh, serious reactions to your heart, okay? into your organism. So you should never consider more than 10% of blood volume. Again, an example is five liters, 10% of five liters is 500 milliliters. So make sure that you never get that much blood drawn at one time. We usually only collect a minimum required specimen volumes. So most of the tubes are three to five mLs. So that is all we need. And now another possible complication is inadvertent arterial puncture. And this is, uh, can happen usually when you try to puncture the, the areas in the wrist area where you have your radial pulse. If you have a pulse, you have an artery here. You have an ulnar artery here. You have your basilic artery here, which runs around here. Remember, because we have a pulse here. So you might accidentally puncture them. What happens? Sometimes if you go through the artery, they're going to have bleeding inside the arm, causing a hematoma. It, the blood fills very quickly. It's because you punctured a hematoma. I mean, excuse me, you punctured an artery and you may cause a hematoma. This is a serious complication. So you have to make sure that you report it and document it if this should happen. Hematomas can also, uh, we can also cause infection. All right, I know this is rare, but when we collect blood samples, we are piercing the skin. We are introducing of course, sterile equipment. However, there is bacteria in the skin and it's going straight into the bloodstream. So a person may develop a, an infection, okay? We can avoid this by uh, limiting or practicing, right? Antiseptic measures like washing your hands, using antiseptics, using gloves, okay? Uh, using your tape of bandages, uh, you know, brand new. Do not put the tape on the, on, the, on the table or on the edge of the table or anywhere else. You don't need to do that. Okay, so by preparing uh, tapes or bandages ahead of time, 
you're uh, actually bringing contamination to the site and you're going to introduce it to the to the puncture site, therefore increasing the risk of the patient developing a, um, a an infection. Preloading needles on tube holders, again, that's also, um, you're opening the needles before you use it, it also increases the chances of you introducing infection. Don't touch the needle insertion site after you clean it. Remember, you cannot go back and contaminate it. Once you clean it, you should not go back and palpate it anymore. Minimize time between needle cap removal and Benny puncture. So once you remove the cap, inspect the needle, make sure it's not blunt, and right away you go in there and insert the needle into the arm. Do not expose it to the environment. Remind the patient to keep any bandages on for at least 15 minutes after the venipuncture site because the blood clot is forming there. It keeps the, um, the puncture site closed, uh, free from contamination or infections. Nerve injury. Nerve injury is, of course, a serious complication. It's caused by improper site or vein selection. As we said many, many times, you do not want to collect a specimen from the basilic vein because you are increasing the risk of um, uh, probing or poking the, the nerve that controls the distal part of the, you know, the hand and the distal part of the arm, okay? If you injure this nerve, you will cause something called a claw hand, okay? You puncture the ulnar nerve, the one that goes here, okay? And some of the fingers will contract like that, making it look like a claw, okay? So make sure that you don't probe around there or do perform blind probing around that side. It's not necessary. Excessive lateral redirection going side to side, back and then to the other side, that's you know blind probing and that is completely unacceptable. If initial vein entry is unsuccessful, uh, use slight forward or backward redirection of needle. Okay, just come slightly back, very slightly, right? No lateral going to the sides, right? Just slightly and Try to anchor that vein, make sure it doesn't move so that you are successful in accessing the vein. Reflex or anticoagulant, okay, of anticoagulant. Now, there's some tubes that have anticoagulants, okay, all your EDTA tubes, right, your sodium citrates and so on. Uh, this, uh, this chemical can go back into the patient's arm, but you can prevent it simply by lowering the arm instead of having a, a, a horizontal plane go ahead and lower the arm so when the blood does come into the tube it falls from the bottom up right if you have a horizontal arm like this and the tubes is this way or horizontal what are you doing you're actually uh, making contact with a chemical and the blood is right there very close to the to the needle which can cause uh, the blood to flow back into the vein causing reflux so very important that you do not cause this because a patient may develop an adverse reaction, right, to the chemical. Keep the arm in a downward position and the tube below the venipuncture site. Rarely uh, do we cause vein damage, but it can happen again uh, after repeated numerous puncture sites. Over time, patients get, uh, many patients get blood drawn over and over and over again. And you're gonna notice that some of the veins uh, develop like a little a little ball, like a little bump. And that's because uh, it's scar tissue. After many punctures, right? And patients actually continue to ask you to puncture them there because that's where they always get it, right? Especially those that are difficult uh, to collect, okay? They're difficult draws. They tell you, you know, this is where you get it. And you notice they're gonna have like a little bump. That's scar tissue that developed over the, over the vein. Um, avoid blind probing, okay? Improper techniques, stick to the guidelines and you will be fine. But once you start doing your own thing, uh, you know, um, going away from the guidelines, that is when you're opening yourself up to, to, to risk and liability. All right, so we continue our conversation um, on chapter nine, pre-analytical um, errors or considerations. And we have to discuss the topic about the specimen quality concerns because a lot of the um, specimens are rejected uh, mainly because of a couple of reasons we're just about to talk about, okay? So when you bring a specimen to the lab, okay, and it's rejected, you're gonna be asking yourself why when they tell you you have to recollect and recollect and you're gonna get frustrated. So by simply knowing, uh, knowing or being aware of the possible things that can happen because of the lack of technique or proper technique, okay? 
you are going to uh, save yourself a lot of time and frustration, okay? You're also gonna be saving the patient's time, money, and their uh, delay of treatment, all right? So be, please be very aware of these possible things can happen. I've said, I've talked about several H words. I've talked about hematomas, okay? I've talked about hemolysis, hemoconcentration. So here is where you have to be aware of these, okay? So one of the uh, quality concerns is hemoconcentration. What causes hemoconcentration? The most common reason is dehydration. Okay, a decrease, decrease in fluid content of blood. If a person is dehydrated, they have less fluid in the body. So when you collect a specimen, it's going to be a little bit thicker. It runs down a little bit slower. So this may be a possible cause. So we don't want a concent, uh, concentrated specimen because it's gonna yield inadequate results. Some of those um, uh, blood electrolytes, okay, that are there in the serum and the plasma, they're gonna be elevated, okay? So think about it. Think about the example I gave um, about a glass of water, okay? A glass of water, uh, you know, it's completely full and you put 10 teaspoons of sugar, okay? And then you decide, you know what? I'm just gonna take out some water. Okay, so you take out water and now that, that glass is gonna be more concentrated with sugar, it's gonna be a lot sweeter, okay? So any changes or decrease in fluid, in fluid is going to alter the results of the specimen. Okay, so hemoconcentration, an increase in no, non-filterable large molecules. Okay, some um, molecules are like your sugars, okay, your proteins and so on, that are not able to be filtered out of the blood, okay, can cause hemo, can be, uh, uh, as a result of hemoconcentration, okay? It can be caused by the stagnation of normal venous flow due to the tourniquet. So when you apply your tourniquet too long on the arm, okay, you're limiting the blood flow, okay? Remember, the purpose of the tourniquet is only to slow venous return, not to restrict, okay? You don't want to restrict arterial flow. If you notice that the patient's uh, arm is getting a little bit reddish or purple, then you probably have applied that, that tourniquet too long. If uh, the person tells you my hand is you know, tingling or feels numb, you've had that tourniquet too long, you know that you should not apply the tourniquet for more than one minute according to the venipuncture procedure, all right? So again, please make sure you wear that. If you do, then you will be causing hemoconcentration, all right? Hemolysis is another H word that we need to be aware of, okay? Hemo means blood, lysis means breakdown or destruction. So we, how can you possibly destroy your red blood cells? Well very easily, all right, by doing, performing vigorous uh, shaking, okay? When you get your specimen and you do it too hard or you shake it like that, you are actually destroying the red blood cells. Those red blood cells will spill into the serum and the plasma when they are centrifuged and we call what they call a, um, a hemolyzed specimen and it's going to be rejected. That's probably the biggest reason why specimens get rejected because of hemolysis, okay? So hemoglobin escapes into the fluid part of the specimen, which is your serum or your plasma, and therefore uh, yielding a hemolyzed specimen that will be rejected, okay? Tubes that are partially fill, filled, okay, can also be rejected. Remember, especially if you bring tubes that have uh, anticoagulants, such as your sodium citrates, the blood to additive ratio isn't correct, is gonna be rejected immediately, all right? Remember, there is a line that tells you the fill line you should make sure that you uh, fill that specimen tube onto that line, all right? Specimen contamination. It doesn't occur often, but it can, all right? If you're going to perform a procedure and you do not allow alcohol to dry air by itself, okay? Some of that alcohol residue may come into the specimen and, you know, uh, affect the fingerprints, uh, powder from some gloves, baby powder if you're collecting a specimen from, a, from an infant, from, you know, in their bassinet, uh, any urine or anything that is inside the bassinet can possibly con uh, contaminate your specimen. If it's a heel specimen, which will cover in capillary punctures, uh, anything that is around in the bassinet will contaminate your specimen. Getting glove powder, uh, blood films, uh, dripping, your sweating, coming into your blood specimen, obvious contamination, following proper antiseptic procedures, such as not washing your hands or sanitizing your hands before the procedure and using the wrong antiseptic. These, There'll be at times when you cannot use alcohol. There'll be at times uh, when you cannot use iodine. So if you're collecting an alcohol level, obviously you cannot use alcohol to cleanse the site. If you're going to be collecting um, uh, trace minerals, you probably won't be able to use iodine. So please make sure you follow the guidelines uh, for specific tests. 
All right. Now using wrong or expired collection tubes, obviously this is a this is a very easy to determine. You should not never be using wrong or expired collection tubes because uh, number one, uh, they will have uh, less vacuum. You will not be collecting enough specimen. Okay. And collecting, you know, using the wrong tube for the wrong test, obviously is going to be rejected. So be very, very aware of that. The tube position, we talked about um, inserting the, the, the tube into the tube holder, okay? Make sure that uh, when you pu push it in, you can do a twisting motion so that the tube goes in there, okay? So be very aware of that. If the needle fails to penetrate the stopper, there will be no blood flow, okay? Make sure that you stabilize the tube holder when inserting the tubes. Right, when using the ATS system, very important. Remember to troubleshoot failed vein puncture. Uh, the important steps: uh, you always stop, assess the problem, and make the correction. Okay, make sure that you do not um, perform uh, blind sweeps. Look at the needle position when you're looking at the, uh, trying to recover a vein. Okay, is it too far? Are you too far in? Are you not far in enough? Okay. Is the bevel partially sticking out of the skin? If that is the case, you'll probably have to start again. Is the bevel partially into the vein? So when you insert the needle, okay, you can only um, imagine, okay, say this is um, the, the vein, okay, and the needle goes in. Sometimes it, the bevel may be partially in, sometimes maybe way all the way through. You retract the vein and come, uh, the needle and come back into the vein and you might get blood draw. Sometimes you go right through it, through the side, Okay, so just kind of take a step back and look at, evaluate the process, okay, and make the correction uh, if needed. The bevel is the very important part. It's the one that goes into, the one that pierces the skin when you insert it, all right? So make sure that that bevel is completely, is facing up and it is in the vein, okay? As long as you um, anchor the vein correctly using the L method, you should be fine, okay? Again, it takes practice to, to become very good at, at uh, at needle punctures. So don't be discouraged if you have uh, troubles in, uh, in the beginning, all right? There's a lot of issues that can happen during the, um, the vein puncture procedure. But again, we try to correct them uh, whenever possible. Uh, the needle position, uh, correct needle position, usually the blood can flow freely into the needle as you'll find out. If the needle is not inserted far enough, especially when a patient is obese, uh, you may not be going uh, deep enough, so you can continue to proceed um, further in. Uh, the needle does not enter the vein, you will not have any blood flow. So for that, for that problem, you have to insert it just a little bit more. If the needle bevel partially out of the skin, okay, the tube vacuum will be lost. So when you try to uh, recover a vein and there is um, a little bit of blood comes into the tube, okay, you say you straight to pull back out, thinking that you're too far in and the bevel comes out of the skin, the vacuum is lost. As soon as you remove the needle from the skin, the vacuum is exhausted. So you have to start again. If the bevel, in case partially into the vein, causes blood leakage into the tissue. So you start to see a little bit of blood coming uh, under the skin and that's what could happen, all right? Because you partially uh, penetrated the vein, right? It's partially in. So the, the blood will seep out, you know, out to the skin and you see this bruising starting to form or hematoma, okay? If the bevel is completely through the vein, there is no blood flow. They're usually, and you can easily tell when you went through it because there's no blood flow and you can tell that a lot of the needle has gone into the patient's arm, okay? You're probably too far. So slowly come back, okay? Slowly come back and until you see blood return if you see blood return, all right, and uh, try to make the readjustment if possible. And remember, do not do any uh, blind probing or side to side uh, probing. That is not acceptable. The needle uh, bevel against the upper uh, wall of the vein prevents blood flow, all right? So when you insert the vein, especially in the endocubital area, okay, if the arm is bent a little bit, you might have the bevel end up hitting the top wall of the vein and getting blocked and you might not get blood return. So try to make sure that the patient has a straight arm, straight arm. And if that uh, you see blood flow, then that was a problem. If not, you might have to, again, come back out just slightly, very slightly without taking the needle out. 
sometimes the needle bevel is against the lower part of the vein. And this is usually if you insert the bevel facing down, which you shouldn't, okay? It should be always be facing up, not down. Uh, again, this could be caused by the wall of the vein uh, or the bevel being against the wall, lower part of the vein. The bevel penetrates a valve preventing blood flow. Uh, this could happen usually on the veins of the hand. When you insert, uh, when you, you're palpating a vein, okay, and you feel or you see little bumps or like uh, little bumps on the vein, that is actually what we call a valve. This valve prevents blood from going back this way. Remember, venous flow is towards the heart, okay? And um, if you see a little bump in a vein, that is a valve. You should avoid um, puncturing the vein at that side. You should maybe go away from it distally or maybe uh, more on the upper arm right over it, okay? But never close to the valve because this will probably not allow you to collect any blood specimens and you will probably damage the valve, okay? So make sure that you don't poke anybody close to a valve. The needle besides the vein, this is very, very common when we uh, do not anchor the veins properly uh, or the veins roll to the side because we didn't anchor correctly, you're gonna be right beside it, okay? Or maybe you palpated the vein, you know, going in a certain direction and you inserted the needle straight, okay? Not with the direction of the vein, then you're gonna see that uh, you're gonna be right beside it. You're gonna miss the vein, okay? And sometimes when you release the, uh, the vein, when you unanchor it, you're going to see that the vein comes to the side and your needle is right there next to it. It happens very, very often. This is very common when we do not anchor the veins correctly. Even if they don't roll, it's always best to anchor the veins, okay, because they might have very slight movement when you insert the needle into the vein, right? The needle will push the vein and the, the vein will move slightly and your needle is going to be right next to it, okay? So it's important that you always anchor the veins and you can prevent, um, again, missing the vein by anchoring correctly. A collapsed vein prevents blood flow despite correction of needle. Sometimes your blood flow will stop. It will come to a complete stop. Okay, why? Because the vein collapses. When do they collapse? Remember that you're going to select the equipment necessary to, uh, depending on the condition of the vein and the patient. So if you have a weak dehydrated patient, the veins are going to collapse because of the vacuum in the, in the vacuum containers. All right, so you have no control of it. So what will you do? Well, if you notice this right away, then you should make the selection of the appropriate equipment by using a 10 ml syringe, 20 ml syringe, where you have more control of the vacuum, all right? So if the patient has very small veins, again, they will uh, collapse with the amount of pressure from the vacuum containers. So you make sure that you collect a syringe using a syringe method. So you try to um, troubleshoot fell vein punctures as much as you can. Uh, when the vein walls draw together or they collapse, okay? Uh, caused by the vacuum, uh, or the plunger, if, it, if the plunger, if you use a very small syringe and you try to collect like that, uh, the plunger will pull the vein and it will completely close and therefore you will not be collecting any blood from that patient. The tourniquet is too tight or too close to the site could also cause the veins to collapse. The tourniquet is removed during the draw, my, my completely um, stop the blood flow. Again, we, don't, we, we can leave the tourniquet on until the last two if the person has uh, uh, very slow uh, blood flow, you can leave it there, especially with the elderly people. Uh, tube vacuum. Uh, tube vacuum, when you have a uh, tube that you suspect maybe it doesn't have enough vacuum or it started but then it stopped, go ahead and try another tube. Just have extra tubes um, handy in case one of them does not have. The loss of vacuum due to bevel partially out of the skin uh, when you insert the tube or when you're handling uh, the tubes, put them in there, uh, what can happen is that your needle might accidentally move, okay? And it happens very often if you don't secure the tube holder to the skin, to the arm. <clears throat> when you insert the tube, okay, you, you may accidentally move the needle and it may come out and you will have uh, no, no blood come out or you may lose the vacuum. So uh, that is all we have for chapter nine. Uh, we covered a lot of ground in this chapter. Again, it's a very, very important topic so that you know how to prevent complications. We talked about the different complications, including the um, fainting, nausea and vomiting, seizures, uh, fear of needles, uh, et cetera. So it is your job to understand what the possible complications uh, that can happen 
to take this into consideration when you're going to collect a specimen how is my technique going to affect the quality of the specimen is it going to be rejected so you have to again adhere follow the 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 guidelines as far as specimen collection is concerned the venipuncture procedure you must follow it as is and not stray away from it where you're going to cause some possible complications so again uh, please go back and practice, practice, practice. That is what's going to make you a good flip, uh, phlebotomist out in the field. And uh, you will be able to go home uh, with a peace of mind that you did uh, something good for the patients, that you're contributing to the, uh, to the care of this patient. And again, never uh, seem too rushed when providing care. Take your time, but at the same time, be, be efficient. All right. You do have to... Um, collects a certain amount of specimens that is expected of you, but always know your limitations. If you have uh, difficulty or have trouble with certain uh, types of patients, then you might as well ask somebody else to collect it and uh, maybe exchange another patient for, for them. So we talked about a lot of the criteria uh, to select a, um, a suitable site, right? The vein selection, we talked about that. Um, some of the substances that can interfere in, in your specimens, such as medications, uh, blood constituents, exercise, diet, and, and all those uh, possible um, physiological causes. And uh, there's so much that we can learn from this chapter, all right? But uh, again, it's uh, take it very seriously because the results or that you produce will yield the results uh, of the patient. They're waiting for your blood specimen collection so the doctors can treat the patient accordingly. So again, you have to be very um, effective, very efficient, okay, and very accurate. Uh, phlebotomy should not be taken lightly. Uh, they, you're just another uh, part of the team and it's very, your work is just as important as anybody else's. So good luck and we'll see you on the next chapter.